God is promising a restoration to the land of Israel. There's a, a geographic dimension here that uh, you can't ignore simply because it's in the text. I'll bring you back to the land. Well, welcome to the podcast again today. My name is Jeff. I'm your host. And uh, our guest today is a returning guest. We've had Peter with us often, Peter Sukahira. And uh, today we're talking about the scattering and regathering of Israel. Uh, Peter's a Bible teacher and a visionary based on Mount Carmel in Israel. He's the co-founding pastor of the Carmel Congregation and director of the Mount Carmel School of Ministry. He's lived in Israel for more than 30 years and ministers there and throughout the world. Uh, through his lectures, books, and videos, he is author of God's Tsunami, Understanding Israel, and End Time Prophecy, and other books as well, his most recent being Equip, Your Personal Journey to the Kingdom. Uh, Peter, welcome back to the podcast. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be with you today. Well, today we're continuing a series focused on Bible prophecy, and particularly uh, Bible prophecies that, that have been or will be fulfilled through Israel. And uh, I'm going to read just a couple of scriptures for us as we begin. The first one is in uh, Jeremiah 31, uh, verses 7 through 10. And here's what it says. This is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. And make your praises heard and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labor. A great throng will return and they will come with weeping and they will pray as I bring them back. And I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble because I am Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. And uh, that is just a great word. And then Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 22 to 24 says, therefore, say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. And I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord declares the Sovereign Lord, when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries, and bring you back into your own land. Wow. These are uh, just amazing texts, Peter, and uh, I know that you are going to add a lot to this conversation. I feel like just just reading the Word of God uh, brings with it a certain uh, excitement and, and there's an anointing on that. And, and there's even a level of understanding, I think, as people read, you know, lights come on. The Holy Spirit illuminates the Bible to our hearts, uh, Jesus tells us. But I think some Christians might read these scriptures and uh, feel either some sort of personal application or an application to the church today, or maybe, you know, no application at all. So let's dig into them a little bit. Who wrote these prophecies? Help us with that first. Well, these are two amazing uh, predictions given by uh, a couple of the greatest prophets of Israel, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They're considered by scholars of the Bible, the major prophets. They're the ones who gave uh, uh, incredible witness that have been enshrined in the inspired words of Scripture for uh, centuries, for thousands of years. And now, um, now we look at them in a, in a new light, um, because if, if we map them into the uh, occurrences uh, that have happened in our world just in the last, um, in the last century, uh, we mm -hmm. see a remarkable and um, an, an amazing alignment 
with the actual uh, events of uh, of current history. So, um, you know, it's it's kind of like you might say falling through a time warp when we look at the mm -hmm. words of these scriptures and read them for uh, just the plain meaning. Uh, it, it takes kind of a stripping away of the um, traditional uh, ap approach to, uh, to, to scripture and, and, you know, we enshrine these writers and, and, and put a lot of significance on their words. But all of a sudden in our day, uh, the, the literal facts of what they're speaking are uh, uh, appearing uh, in our current events. And so it's, um, it's, it's really kind of a, a revelatory wake-up call, I believe, specifically for our generation that was, uh, that was written to us um, by God so long ago. You, you, in one way, you could say it's like finding a time capsule, you know, that was, yeah. that was preserved for us you know, from right. centuries and centuries ago and opening up and going, oh my goodness, it's for, it's for now. So yes. um, these two, uh, two powerful words, and you know, the other remarkable thing, uh, Jeff, is that they're, they're, they're not isolated occurrences in the Bible. This uh, mm. turns into a theme that we see uh, the word of God returning to again and again, um, uh, not only in, in these prophets, but in others. And, and we even see it embedded in the foundational worldview of the New Testament writers. So right. um, I think uh, that uh, the fact that this was written by two of the preeminent biblical prophets of Israel, two of the major prophets, is really significant. Now, Peter, I, I like what you said there, the, the fact that there's a theme. And obviously, we've sort of, uh, you know, cherry picked two of these texts so that we can look at the bigger uh, the bigger picture of what God is doing. And um, you've told us who wrote these. Tell us who who was originally the audience for these words that were written by uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And, and, and does that, you know, does that original audience impact sort of modern times? Is there, is there a modern audience that this was intended for as well? I think you can see clearly in the words uh, of the, that are that are preserved for us uh, in the scriptures that there are at least two audiences. First of all, the prophets are speaking directly to the people of Israel. They are the prophets of Israel, yes. and their their calling was to prophesy uh, to the, to the people of God. But in both cases, both in Jeremiah's prophecy and in Ezekiel's. Uh, it's clear that God has an international audience in mind. For example, in Jeremiah's prophecy, he says, declare this among the nations, you know, shout this to the, to the yes. chief of, of the nations. And here that word nations, uh, in the, in the Hebrew language is goyim, uh, which uh, is alternatively translated Gentiles. So it literally means right. the non Jewish people, the people other than Israel, you uh, should proclaim this. And in the Ezekiel uh, passage that you read, uh, it's, it says that um, God intends for the nations to know. So then the nations, the non-Israelite peoples will know that I am the Lord when they see me do this with you, Israel. So there's two audiences. God is speaking through the prophet to the people of Israel, but he intends this message to go yeah. beyond uh, to the nations. And there's two times. He's speaking to Israel at the time uh, that the prophets lived, but he's, he's speaking beyond that. And that's the, that's the amazing uh, truth of, of biblical prophecy, is that it has this eternal quality to that. And uh, that's why for, uh, for thousands of years, Jews, as well as Christians, have revered these words as the words of God and preserved them. I mean, literally letter for letter, um, the Essenes and the, and the scribes of, uh, who have preserved the scriptures, you right. know, knew that it was not just for the time that the prophets spoke, but it was for all time. And it was for future events, uh, that they were, uh, that they were speaking. And that's the amazing, um, inspired nature of biblical prophecy. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
And I, I love in the Ezekiel text, this is just a little bit of an aside thought for me, but how God goes into some great detail through Ezekiel's prophecy to say to uh, the the Israelites in particular, hey, look, this isn't all about you. I, you know, I'm doing this to... to um, sort of give my holy name credibility. I'm, I'm doing it so that people will know who I am. People will know that I'm God, right? It's, uh, it's an incredible thought. Uh, what is it that God is promising in these verses exactly? I mean, we read them together. We can sort of all draw our own conclusions, but, but flesh it out for us. What's God saying here? It's pretty clear in both of these passages, God is promising a restoration to the land of Israel. There's a, a geographic dimension here that uh, you can't ignore simply because it's in the text. I'll bring you back to the land. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is, again, um, a major theme of, uh, of the Old Testament writers because when God uh, called Abraham, he promised him that I'll make you a nation, I'll make you a great nation, and I will give you a land. And this is a uh, part of being a nation is that you'll have you'll have a territory and this is a specific territory. It's a gift from God. And God uh, goes through great pains to say this is an everlasting inheritance throughout all of your generations. But later on, God says, when you when you disobey me, I may scatter you out of the land that I'm giving you. So the, the, the land itself is a gift of God to the people of Israel, but the, but the privilege of living in the land, of being in the land, is something, is something that the people of uh, Israel have because of their obedience and their faithfulness to God. So God mm -hmm. says, if you disobey me, if you prove to be unfaithful, I may scatter you from the land, but... Even if I scatter you, I'll never forget you. I will bring yeah. you back to the land I promised your fathers. And again, this is a recurring uh, theme uh, throughout uh, the Bible. And, um, you know, of course, in the New Testament, they understood that because they had been scattered once and then brought back again. Uh, they had been right. in, in Babylon and returned after 70 years. And that was part of their history. Uh, and... Um, and so they they understood the, uh, the the that meaning of God, God's word. I'll bring you back to the land. Yeah. So there's an indication here of both scattering and regathering, and that's sort of what we said right off the top. Now, you referenced uh, how that um, Jews in the New Testament era would would have understood this. That was a, a fulfillment of the prophecy when when they were, you know, brought back after 70 years from Babylon. But was that was that the entire fulfillment uh, or or is there more? Well, in in, in these two prophecies, it, if you look carefully at the words and this is the the amazing thing is that the, the meaning is in the words. It's it's not in the. Uh, the traditions or uh, or this person's interpretation or that person's interpretation. It's trying, it's in getting close to the text, to the actual words of the text that the meaning begins to come out. And, uh, you know, it's, it's clear that this was, this was something that was meant uh, for the people of Israel and, uh, but that it would have implications uh, with the other nations. And in Jeremiah's prophecy, it specifically references, I'm going to bring you back from the north. So God says where he's going to bring them back. Um, remarkably, in our time, we've uh, seen since the 1990s, a, an amazing, huge aliyah or a, a, a return of the Jewish people from the former Soviet Union, uh, yeah. which is continuing even today. And with the current uh, war in the Ukraine, uh, now it's not just Jewish uh, people that are coming from the north to, to find refuge in Israel, but refugees as well. Uh, our facilities now on Mont Carmel are filled with uh, Ukrainian refugees, as well as Russian Jewish immigrants who are continuing mm -hmm. to come. And uh, some are saying that the uh, pace is picking up again. Uh, and so Jeremiah's prophecy says, I'll bring you back from the north country. If you go directly north from where I'm sitting tonight on Mount Carmel, you uh, pass into Lebanon, uh, Turkey, 
And then there's the Black Sea. And directly north across the Black Sea is the Ukraine. And directly north of the Ukraine is Russia. In fact, you know, the metropolitan center of Moscow is almost directly north of Jerusalem. So it's a wow. it's a very, very specific, you know, I'll I'll I'll, I'll bring you yeah. back. And um, yeah. also the the same in um, in Ezekiel, it says, I'll bring you back from all the nations. So, you know, even though uh, it, we can apply these scriptures to the Babylonian captivity, that was basically one nation for a limited period of time, just about, seven, well, 70 years. Um, right. But the scripture clearly says, I will take you out of right. the nations. I will bring you from all the countries and bring you back into your land. It's a, it's a repeated plural in that uh, 24th verse of uh, Ezekiel chapter 36. And, um, and so you, you, it, you can't ignore that, that, that this right. is a widespread uh, regathering uh, from, from many nations. And the context of both of these prophecies is that God intends it to be a, a worldwide event. He's not going to do this in a corner. Uh, it's it's not a, a a private thing. It's a worldwide thing. Wow, that's uh, some incredible insight, and I love how you sort of went north on the map and and lined up all of those those locations for us. Incredible, incredible fulfillment of prophecy when you think about the number of uh, particularly uh, Russian Jews who have made Aliyah in the last, uh, what would I say, 30, 30 years or so, 35 years or so. And right. uh, I know I know that, you know, that was one of the things that our, our founder, Reverend Clyde Williamson, uh, prayed uh, desperately for and the very first Esther fast that they did uh, back in the uh, in the mid 1980s really um, you know was was before this Aliyah started happening it's just it's amazing to be connected to all of that and now you also mentioned but Jews coming from all over the world and I think that's that's the other thing that we sort of want to get to when we're talking about this right now is that is that in the last hundred years or so since uh, the the kind of late 18th early 19th or late 19th early 20th century um, Jews have been coming by the thousands from from around the world back to the land of uh, of Israel, uh, what was then known as, uh, you know, as Palestine, which we know has nothing to do with what we talk about today uh, in terms of Palestine. But but this has yeah. been this has been happening. You know, this is not only did it uh, was it partially fulfilled in the in the Old Testament times and in Bible times, but it's now being fulfilled um, today. It's exciting to think about. Now, it's not fully fulfilled, though, right? There still there still are some aspects that have yet to be fulfilled. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, you know, um, since the creation of the state of Israel uh, back in the 1940s, uh, it's actually millions of, of immigrants that have come. And those those numbers that you share are, are almost overwhelming because if you think about seventy five years, I think we'll celebrate seventy five years next next spring, next May, of uh, of independence of the state of Israel. That in that period of time, now uh, more than half of the Jews who live in the world reside in Israel. I, I believe we just passed that that sort of fifty percent number in the last year year and a half. Am I right about that? Yes, and and that's that's an amazing thing. Amazing, um, because um, yeah, <laughs> really amazing after yeah. nearly two thousand years uh, for for this to to begin to take place. That the balance is tipping, and uh, frankly, we expect many many more to come. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's unprecedented, is is what it is. I mean, I don't know if we can point to any other example. Uh, in the world where something like this has ever happened after 2000 years. And that in itself, uh, you know, has to weigh heavy in people's minds when you think about the, the fulfillment, the ongoing fulfillment of this prophecy. And, um, you know, I want to just ask you this question because a lot of, a lot of people in the world, a lot of Christians in the world uh, don't 
give a lot of weight to to what we're talking about right now in terms of of um, you know modern day Israel being uh, fulfillment of scriptural prophecy. How how should we as Christians be handling these prophecies in the Bible that are directed toward Israel? Because I think too often we you know we veer off and, and talk about the church. Just help bring us back a little bit there. Well, you know, the, the Jeremiah prophecy that you read at the beginning of this uh, program, it says, shout among the chiefs of the nations, yeah. go out, proclaim, tell them. And so I think part of it is, is the story needs to, needs to be told that, um, that A, the existence of the modern state of Israel as the homeland for the Jewish people is uh, just its existence is an unprecedented historic event yeah that never in humanity has that sequence of events taken place for a where a people uh grew into a nation uh had a land uh had a had a kingdom had a golden age were attacked destroyed and scattered by their enemies and then wandered the world mm -hmm. for nearly two millennia and then came back and started again in the place where they were originally. That, that series of just historic events has happened exactly once in the history of humanity, and it happened to the people of Israel, and that last part happened in our time. Right. Uh, so, so first of all, it's like, it's like recognizing the, the historic scope. But uh, when you add to that, the fact that, that the Bible predicts it, and God goes on record in writing, as it were, not once or twice, but literally dozens of times to say, I'm going to do this. I will um, bring you back to this land uh, that I promised your fathers. So it's, it's, it, that needs to be pointed out. But I have to add that there is a revelatory aspect to, to understanding this. At a certain mm -hmm. point, I think there needs to be a spirit of truth that cuts through uh, yeah. the the politics and the and the the, the anthropology yep. <laughs> and the and the the, uh, the the old stones of history and uh, and and you need to see uh, the hand of God. Um, this is 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 a huge prophetic fulfillment because of the number of times the number of verses that it fulfills and the fact that it is a historically unprecedented event uh, in uh, in human history converging in this uh, uh, event which is the the the, the modern nation of Israel mm -hmm. so for for people to get this I think we really need to not only tell the story but we also need to pray that the spirit of truth will enlighten their hearts and the, they'll be able to perceive the height depth width and all the dimensions of uh, of this yeah. event of our time I, I think that's great. And I think that uh, what I want to say to anybody who's listening or who's watching right now that, you know, part of part of experiencing something revelatory like that is is the attitude of our hearts. It's it's our openness toward uh, what God is trying to say to us. And I think that if you're if you're listening, if you're watching and you're still skeptical about this, maybe, or, or you, you know, have another view, another approach that that the real sort of honest way to deal with this is just to say to God, look, I this is how I feel. But but if you're trying to say something different to me, I'm open to what you want to say. And I want to I want to hear what it is that you're saying to me today. And I think if we if we approach uh, these things in that sort of heart and spirit, then it gives it gives the Holy Spirit the open door to be able to, you know, to to drop that penny, so to speak, and and help people really connect with what it is God is saying. And so, um, just kind of wanted to to throw that in there because I think it's so important the attitude the attitudes of our of our hearts. You know, if we're always um, dogmatic in any in anything that we believe, then um, we're we're not really we're not open to what anybody else has to say about it. But we're also not being we're also not being fair to God. We're not we're not being open to what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us as well. Well, Jeff, you know there there is uh, for some 
the stumbling block of uh, perceived uh, perceived favoritism. Uh, and you know there are some who who you know kind of it's it's hard to to embrace uh, the concept, even though it's biblical, of a chosen people and a promised land, uh, and uh, and God singling out uh, the people of Israel for this uh, particular particular destiny. Uh, and that's why I think the uh, Ezekiel prophecy is so important. Where in the first verses that you read earlier. I think it begins in verse 22, where God says, uh, Israel, listen, I'm not doing this for your sake. It's not because of your virtuous qualities. It's not because you deserve this. It's not because you're superior in any way. Uh, rather, I'm doing this for my holy name's sake. The reason that I'm going to gather you and bring you back from the nations and put you back in the land uh, is has more to do with God's identity than the identity of the people of Israel. God says, I'm doing this because of my character, my reputation, and I want the nations to know who I am. So I'm, uh, you might say, I'm using you, Israel, again, as my instrument, but my objective is to bless the nations. I want the nations to know I'm the covenant-keeping God. I'm the God who keeps his promises. <laughs> I'm the God, I, 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 I make a covenant, I keep a covenant. And, you know, when we see it in this light, we realize this is, this is a foundational uh, uh, stone in, 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 our, in our faith understanding of who is God as for Christians everywhere. This really should be the starting point. We, we have a, a, a bedrock trust in the God who keeps covenant and in the faithfulness of God. You know, some people say, no, the beginning point is, is God is love. But, you know, if someone says, I love you, and you don't think that they tell you the truth, then, then it doesn't really mean as much as, as it might sound like. Uh, but if someone that you trust, whose word is true, someone that you know keeps their promise, then, then they say they love you, then it really has meaning. And so I, I really think God starts with trust. He says, I want the nations to know I'm the God that keeps his promises. I'm the God of truth. Wow, that's great. Trust and, and faithfulness, um, you know, give give credibility to love. <laughs> that's that's kind of what you're saying there. I think that's amazing. And uh, wow, and, good stuff. You, you know, it, it's I, I see this as, as a non-Jewish uh, Israeli, as someone who's been become a part of the of this uh, Aliyah and, and a part of the nation of Israel as um, as foundation to my faith as a Christian, because mm -hmm. uh, what makes me a Christian is that I share a covenant with this same living God. And in the covenant that he made with me through the blood and, uh, and broken body of, of, of the Lord, through the sacrifice of Jesus himself, he made a covenant with me personally. And yeah. uh, in that covenant, he made me promises. <laughs> he says, if, yeah. if, you, if you believe, you, you will find eternal life. If you confess your sin, you will be forgiven. I mean, these are just a couple of the two precious promises that are integral in the covenant all Christians share with God. This yeah. is the same God who made covenant with Israel. So yeah. how can we believe that he would break his promises to Israel and keep his promises to us? It, it, that's why I, what I mean when I say this is foundational for Christians, a foundational understanding of who is God. And I think that's what he's getting at in Ezekiel. He says, you know, I want the, then the nations, they will know that I yeah. am the Lord. And this is, this is what makes me different uh, from all other gods or all other what would be considered gods. I'm the God who keeps covenant, who keeps his promises forever. Yeah, praise God. Uh, Peter, that's just so refreshing. And, and one of my questions was going to be about, you know, how how has this impacted you on a personal spiritual level? And you've just you've just shared that with us as a, a, a Gentile living in Israel, married to a Jewish person. And, you know, the the beauty in which you talk about how that covenant is so meaningful to you. 
uh, really should speak volumes to all of us who are who are listening to your words today. And I, I thank you for sharing that. Thanks for watching. You can listen to this entire podcast on your favorite audio podcast platform. Find the link below. And while you're at it, don't forget to click subscribe and follow us on Facebook so you can stay connected to First Century Foundations. I was a pastor for over 20 years before I first went to Israel, only to realize that I was totally disconnected from the roots of my faith. Since then, I've been on a journey of discovery and my faith has come alive in ways I never could have imagined. I'm Jeff Uters, Executive Director of First Century Foundations, and I'm excited to invite you to explore the land of the Bible and to discover your part in a Bible story that isn't over yet. First Century Foundations exists to reconnect Christians to the foundations of Christianity. And we do this by creating Bible-based media focused on Israel, but we don't just reconnect you to Israel in the Bible. We help you participate in what God is doing in Israel today by connecting you to over 70 ministries in Israel who desperately need our support. Will you partner with us? Together, we'll explore Israel's biblical past while playing our role in Israel's bright future.